Welcome everyone. It's a Friday. It's the last Friday of September and I'm so glad to have you come here today and join us for this Friday Forum. I will tell you this is probably one of the most popular ones that I've had in a long time. <laughs> Jeff and Jenny, we've got over 300 people who've signed up to listen to you to talk about your big data. So as you're logging in, I want Jeff and Jenny, and of course we have Carmen with us. She's the one that keeps us all sane. Please put your name and where you're from into the chat. I even had opened up the chat so you guys can see how many people are here and um, get that opportunity to not only hear from us, but talk to each other too. So we know we have an audience that scans the globe and I'd love for you all to see each other. And as you're logging in and sharing that, I want to introduce you to my good friends, Jenny Kent and Jeff Levy. I've known you guys for, gosh, I don't know, many, many years. We've grown as consultants. We've watched our industry grow. Jeff and Jenny have their own consulting um, company. Website is Big J College Consulting. Is that right? Educational Consulting, but close enough. <laughs> Something like that. Big J Educational Consulting, yeah. And um, I would recommend that you take a look at their website and learn more about Jenny. She's an international consultant. Um, she's worked in Bogota, Colombia, and worked with students all over the world. And Jeff is from the LA area. And Jeff, you have a specialty in financial aid. I know we've had many conversations about that. Both are featured experts on the Grown and Flown website. And so I see them there quite often. And I just want to say thank you and welcome to you both for being on my Friday Forum today. Well, thanks for having us. Thank you, Cindy. Pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to see so many of our friends in the chat. <clears throat> it so looks welcome. like you've got an STIer in the group and everything, Jeff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so explain what STI is, Jeff. STI is IECA's Summer Training Institute. Um, uh, Jenny and I are on the faculty of it. Jenny is actually a graduate of, uh, of STI. I didn't attend, um, but um, it's something where uh, we teach every summer there. Um, it's for new um, uh, consultants to get a handle on how to begin their business. I highly recommend it. I think all of those professional development opportunities are so valuable for us as educational consultants, as, as college advisors. Um, another one is the HECA Professional Development Institute, which is also offered in the summer. It's offered with the HECA conference. The STI through IECA is kind of a standalone. So the, there's such great resources. And as you can see, there's great faculty for both. So, um, and you can see, yeah, we've got people from all over um, California and just lots of different Florida. Please be safe, those of you in Florida and the Carolinas with all the storms. So today we are gonna talk about big data. And why do you, tell us your backgrounds, first of all. I've given a little bit of an introduction, but give us a little bit more about your background. Jenny, I'm gonna let Jeff, I'm gonna let Jeff go first. Oh, okay, we'll start I with I wanna Jeff. see what he says. Oh, okay. Uh, well, my background is weird because um, I worked in the film and television industry for about 30 years and um, little known secret, you have to promise all of you not to tell anybody, I didn't know I was even a college graduate uh, until uh, I was starting to think about life after the film business. And um, I inquired about um, um, the UCLA extension program. I wanted to dip my foot in the water and see if that might be a profession I'd be interested in. And then I learned that you needed a BA to do it. And I thought, oh no, I guess I have to take some more courses. It turns out that I did graduate 30 years earlier, just didn't know it. Um, but my, uh, my, very first, my very first instructor at UCLA Extension was a young admission counselor at Pitzer College by the name of 
Angel Perez, oh, um, wow. who rocked my world. I mean, his story, his um, his presence uh, in the program. I knew one week into his class that this is what I what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. That's um, amazing. I'd never heard that before. Yeah, I, I I reached out to Angel Prez when I was starting this. We, we both went to Skidmore. That's our shared uh, background. Obviously, I went a little before he did. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, um, I think my background in terms of educational con consulting, um, I actually had a really um, successful career as an author before this. And kind of had no business going into this, but had always wanted to. Um, I went to an educational consultant when I was 14 or 15 years old. And um, there is no question in my mind that that educational consultant saved my life. Um, this is something I've always been interested in. I, you know, I was the kid who was like the tour guide at my boarding school and the tour guide at Skidmore. And um but I just, you know, for me, because um, an educational consultant made so much impact on my own life, I knew that this was something that I was interested in and I was living abroad at the time. And, you know, there just wasn't anybody like an educational consultant where I was. And there were so many families who, who needed help, particularly, you know, international families. Um, international admissions is really straightforward, <laughs> comparatively speaking. To the U.S. So um, the thing that I most love about this work is the teaching aspect. I really love to teach families how admissions works in the U.S. and kind of help guide them through the process. So that gives you, you know, having that motivation for both of you and wanting to work with families and wanting to teach them. What prompted you to start collecting data on all of that? Um, it definitely was international student financial aid. That was our, our first chart. Um, there had been, um, a member of the international ACAC, which at that point was called the overseas ACAC, who had made, um, a, a chart, um, to help counselors with international student financial aid, and then, um, had stopped producing it. And I really needed that data. And Jeff and I met, you know, on, on a tour and we started talking and I, you know, I do international, you do financial aid, let's kind of figure this out um, together. But it really was to demystify a process that was um, entirely too confusing and that just had a, a lot of, um, just a lot of false information out there. <laughs> So I needed to understand it myself to then be able to teach it to, to families. That, that's my memory anyway. Jeff, you look, is that, is that your memory? Uh, I don't have a memory. So it's, everything's a new story to me. Um, no, <laughs> uh, that, 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 is, that is my recollection as well. So we put that out, um, which I think a lot of international consultants and, and applicants found very helpful. Um, and then I got a little jealous. Well, what about the domestic uh, applicants? We need that kind of information for domestic applicants as well. So that was our second chart, I believe. Um, it was our third. Uh, oh, okay. So um, uh, somewhere in between the two, we uh, we also came out with the early decision and regular decision acceptance rates, comparing those. What is readily available um, in that in in that set of data is um, we can we can find early decision acceptance rate and we can find the overall acceptance rate. But nobody, to my knowledge, was extracting the regular decision acceptance rate, so we could really compare apples to apples. So that was uh, our second chart, apparently. Um, <laughs> that we came out with. <clears throat> and was that, so you guys started doing, how many years have you been doing this data? I, well, seven? I, yeah, I was going to say, I, 
I think maybe six or seven. Yeah. It's a while. So when I think started, seven. So when you started doing this, like early decision, you didn't, we didn't really have early decision one, early decision two, EA one, EA two. We didn't know all the complication that we have now. <laughs> and so how has that influenced the data that you're looking at? Do you feel like it makes that data even more powerful or is it um, watering it down? It's a, it's a, that's a very good question. For sure, one of the things that, um, we, we did notice, we have noticed are the addition of these plans. Um, and actually you might be surprised because um, at, at a recent conference, we kind of looked at five years of data and I was really surprised to learn, yes, there are more schools kind of adding plans as we go, but it's less than you might think. I remember thinking like, huh, like to me, it felt like everybody added ED2. Right. Like, but um, actually um, it, there is steady growth, but it's not anything that's huge. I think where you see it are really at the tippity top, most like the really prestigious institutions. Some of them will have added um, ED2. Um, but I, I do think that it, it's there's just a lot of information to to juggle. And, you know, we always get the question, well, what about like EA? Like, what do we know about those admission rates? Um, off the top of my head, I know that um, the College of Worcester, you can find that data. And I think Skidmore, there's, there's a third school too. There's only like three schools when we look at the common data sets that actually break that out additionally. Um, I, I really want um, institutions to be as transparent as possible. And I, my feeling is that um, not everybody wants to do that. <laughs> right, right. That's very true. Very true. Um, Jeff, what, what other aspects would you share about that? I may be jumping the gun here, but one of the things that I've learned about data is that I think our brains are wired to want to extract a coherent story from data. And um, sometimes we impose a story on data that doesn't really exist. So I think anecdotally, as Jenny was saying, most of us feel like <clears throat> more and more schools are adding ED and it's becoming um, less possible to get into a school if you're applying RD, you have to do ED, probably ED1 over ED2. And when we did really look closely at the data, it's hard because of COVID. I mean, it's, you, you can't, COVID changed things. And so you can't really look back over six years and say, this is what has been happening. What I think, one of the lessons I think we've learned from our recent data is that with test optional, there was a significant noticeable jump in ED applications to the US News and World Report top 25 um, uh, national universities. Yeah. All of a sudden, you don't have to submit your SAT scores. So uh, I have a shot of getting in because I was a, almost a straight A student. Yep. But we didn't see that at the US News and World Report top 25 liberal arts colleges. So, mm -hmm. so just as prestigious, doesn't quite have the household, you know, name recognition as, you know, the big Ivy League schools. Um, those did not increase in their ED applications. In fact, it was only, Jenny, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was only that one group that saw a noticeable mm -hmm. increase in ED applications. Hmm. That is interesting. And you're right, you know, COVID had put a whole wrench into everything and the um, really spurned forward the test optional, which was already a movement, but just kind of created a firecracker fire under all of that. And it'll be interesting to see 
in the next few years if that backs away. I mean, we're already seeing a little bit of that, but but that's why. So so one of the questions it looks like, um, Susanna, and you re, you reference this a little bit. So how do you get those RD rates? Um, how do you figure this information out? Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, it, it, so we are sitting in, for months. We sit in front of, we used to use Excel, now we're using Google Sheets. Um, and we have so many columns across that Google Sheet that we're repeating letters of the alphabet. I mean, it's beyond, you know, 20s. It's a lot of columns. Um, essentially, what we're doing to tease out the RD numbers is we from the common data set which is where all of our data comes from um uh and if we can't get a school's common data set um and boy does jenny try because she'll follow up once twice uh with an institution whose common data set is not available publicly uh we will go after them jenny i say we but jenny will go after them um <laughs> Uh, but if we can't get it from their common data set, they don't go into our chart because we want, you know, it's quality control. So um, we can, we know the total number of applicants from the common data set. We know the number of ED applicants from the common data set. We now uh, can learn who is, um, who, who is the total number of RD applicants. And um, we can figure out from, um, from the acceptance rates um, uh, what the acceptance rate is for ED versus RD. But it's entering all of that data and setting up our, our master sheet to have the formulas that we need. So why, so explain what the common data set is, why that you use that, because there's also Peterson's, I mean, you know, you can go, you mentioned US News and World Report, why is the common data set such, what is it, and why is that an important aspect for this? Yeah, so um, the common data set is literally a common set of data that all of the colleges are filling out. Um, they're filling it out for the college board. Princeton Review, and I can't remember the third partner in that. Um, and the reason why we use it is because the colleges are reporting it. It's their official data. It's the data that goes kind of into all of the, every website you see, you know, is like they're pulling data from the common data set. Um, for us, the reason why this is a better resource than iPads, right? A lot of colleges will say, yeah no, we don't share our common data set or you can find all that in iPads, just go to iPads. iPads does not have the data on the international students. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we have to, we're very insistent about um, the, common, the common data set. So what's great for those of you who've never looked at a common data set, you can literally put into Google common data set 2021, 2022. That's the most recent one available. The name of the college, it will usually take you to that college's uh, webpage where you can access it. And there's all kinds of data. This is what I use, you know, when I, you know, will kind of try to get a sense on, you know, what was happening with transfer admissions or, you know, what's happening with financial aid. Um, and we just feel like it's the best source. Um, and, and as Jeff said, there, there are enrollment managers that reach out and say, here are our numbers from last year. And I say, send me the common data. Set. I'm not taking your word for it. Um, okay. Now, do people make mistakes at institutions all the time? This is, you know, what I say to people over and over again is, please don't look at this as a snapshot of an institution. It's more of a collage, right? Because admissions are going to fill out some information, financial aid is going to fill out other information. They might do it on the same day. They might not. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure we can guarantee that they're not doing it on the same day. So it's just, it's just the best source that, that we have, um, but it doesn't mean that it's imperfect. You know, very often people will say, well, you're saying that 127% of, um, you know, the kids uh, are getting financial aid. Well, 
trust me, when anything looks wrong, we verify it. So that's going to be a, a problem with the common data set 99 times out of 100. Um, we really go through it with a with a fine tooth comb. Um, so, um, you know, I think that colleges, um, colleges like to fill out the common data set so that they're included in all of these guidebooks and these websites, but then there are other institutions that really don't want to share all of the data that's in that. They're, they're afraid that maybe the public won't understand their numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and, you know, having come from a technology background, I would, um, you know, reiterate and, and affirm what you've just said, because the common data set, basically, it's an agreement between publishers of this is how we're going to create data so that you're comparing apples to apples. You know, you're not defining test optional or ED or A or admissions from multiple different ways because otherwise you, you don't have a way of comparing it. And iPads data, colleges have to submit that for um, the government, for government, for, <laughs> you know, for funding and things, but it tends to be older. And, and it doesn't break it down in the same way as the common data set. And so the common data set is a very valuable tool that we have, and it is not used in a lot of those other tools and resources or a small portion. It, it is very comprehensive. And the questions for the common data set, they take a long time to change. Remember, it took them forever to change the question about the SCT2s. We hadn't had SCT2s for years, but um, but there is a process so that as the system or the you know college admission changes, then the common data set can adjust. But it, I know from ex personal experience, it does take a while. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, I totally agree. People need to understand what the common data set is and why it's been so important in what you do. So. So Jeff, do you want to show us what you've got and what the com what you, what you have for for this year? Funny, um, you should ask, Cindy, because I do. <laughs> um, you know, um, you asked what have we what have we seen from the data recently? Um, something that I think surprised us both, and I'm <clears throat> I'm going to share it. Um, if we could do a poll, which we're not going to do, but I'd like each of you to take a guess in your mind, privately, how many institutions are admitting 50% or more of their, uh, of their total class from ED, ED1 or ED2, but, you know, combined. How, um, how many institutions do you think are now admitting more than 50% or more of their freshman class from ED. I was very, when we did do the chart and we could sort it for that column and we could actually count the number of schools and I'm gonna share that with you now, the number is very different from what I expected. So I'm gonna come up with a number in your head, whether it's 10 or, a hundred and um i'm gonna i'm gonna share that now and show it to you if i can uh share screen there we go are you seeing that yes we are so this is the column that i've sorted for ed admits as percentage of freshman class and you see the name of the college so um at the top, I wasn't scrolled all the way up. At the top, VMI, 68.5%, Bates, Middlebury, Grinnell. These, um, so this is in descending order, the biggest culprit, you know, to the to the least. But if we scroll down to where 50 becomes 49, um, that's Lesson. Because we start, it's about 25 schools because we're starting at five. So it's only 25 schools that are admitting. And I was surprised by that. I thought the number would be quite a bit higher <clears throat> or admitting 50% um, or more uh, of their class. So that's 
uh, one of the charts, one of the sorts. And, and I, I love I love sorting the chart because um, in our in our um, financial aid chart, I can't memorize the schools that are the most generous with merit aid. So I have a sorted version of my chart of our chart where it's got the schools at the top that have the largest average merit aid award. And then I just work my way down. We don't know how to recommend schools to our families who may not qualify for need-based aid, but boy, they cannot afford 70, 75, 80,000 a year. So, um, you know, we just use our charts all the time and that's why we made them. I would also like to point out that Bates is sort of my, Bates and Claremont McKenna have always been my favorite um, colleges to pick on with <laughs> the uh, percentage of, of class build. Bates is number two. Bates has actually come down significantly. I believe at their worst year, they were like 70.3 or something. I mean, it was outrageous. Yeah. Um, so I want to give them credit for moving in a better direction <laughs> publicly. Well, I know this uh, last year, there was the impression that if you didn't apply ED to Tulane, that you weren't going to get in, like that they had a zero acceptance at that, you know. For it, well, I... I know for my for my international students, um, Tulane reached out to multiples. I'm a fan of Tulane. Um, many students had it on their list, and they said, you know, convert now to ED two. And um, the students who did got in. So go figure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes that makes, and that becomes part of that new process that we're seeing. If you don't get in or apply ED one. And then they get invited to do it ED2. So yeah. what else did you notice that's different about this year's data um, from what you've done in the past? Um, I know that one of the things um, that jumped out at me, um, and I've um I've you know, I've spoken with someone who's who's watching um when we were going through the data, um, when I got to American, the numbers looked really off, like so off that I thought there is no way that this is possible. And so I screenshot the section and I wrote to American and I said, Hey, you know, families rely on these charts and I'd like to verify some information because I'm just not sure that it's accurate. And, um, they confirmed that it, it was accurate. Um, American really overcorrected for COVID and wound up over enrolling by thousands of students. Wow. Um, There's and a, and oh, sorry. Well. And it's just a big question in the chat. Is it possible to get this list? And I just want to confirm that the link that I have is to that list, or if it is possible to get that list that you're referring to um, of the Excel sheet. Oh, it's right on our web. The, the lists are, they're all right. The charts are all okay. right on our website. Yeah, they're all hanging there for free on our website. We, yeah, we need Jeff, to go do back, Go back to that and show them that link. And then let's look at some of the other charts you have too. So yeah, you to come to our website. American. Yeah, so I contacted American. And and uh, so one of the things that I think, and this was what you know Jeff was talking about before with COVID is COVID really threw a wrench in the wheels of many institutions. I believe in the case of, American, they kind of overcorrected, right? Um, and a, a, something like that can really be fixed in one admission cycle, right? Maybe two. Um, so sometimes you see something in the numbers for, from last year, and I think it's really important to think, is this COVID or is this something else? Mm -hmm. um, um so I don't know, I'm not gonna be able to answer, is it COVID or something else? Here is another sort of, uh, another sorting of our ED chart. This one is for ED to RD acceptance rate, ratio. So the biggest spread between the ED acceptance rate and the RD acceptance rate, the win and this surprised me, the winner is Grinnell. I mean, I wouldn't have thought that Grinnell would have a 58% acceptance rate early decision versus 
an 8.2% acceptance rate regular decision. Dartmouth, I mean, that was, to me, that was a shocker to see that kind of spread. And, you know, why? Why, why did they feel that they need to do that? Um, Colby, I think, has been a winner, you know, has been a perennial <laughs> Um, All the main uh, colleges, yeah. Yeah, the main colleges seem to enjoy doing that. You know, Bates is up here as as well, and Bowdoin, they're all in the top 10. Um, and Jenny mentioned Tulane. Here is Tulane. Um, look at their spread, 31.4% ED. And for anyone who wants to know, this would be a combination of ED1 and ED2. Um, um, we're not able to break it out any any more in a, any more granular a way than that. Um, thirty one point four versus seven point six. So the perception now this doesn't include EA. In my opinion, easier to get into Tulane EA than RD as well. So um, uh, there is this, I think, correct perception that if you're not applying in one of the early rounds to Tulane, it gets really difficult to get in. Jeff, could you um, click on the resource tab for our website just to show everybody? Yes. See it in the far right. Um, I might not question, be able to see um, it. Regarding how, how are EA accounted for in your data? Yeah, so EA is not accounted for because there's no way to account for it. So EA gets just kind of lump, lumped in with... Um, RD. With, with RD because that there's no way, there are no questions about EA. So some institutions, same for like ED2, some institutions, like I was mentioning, College of Worcester, Skidmore, they run those numbers themselves and they kind of like paste them on the side of the page um, for the, for the, of the common data set. But there's EA, we have, we just don't know. See, and that's sure. an example where those questions need to be become part of the common data set. They and sure do. Having them. But it, it takes a long time for those questions to get in there. But if you have any connections to anybody in College <laughs> News and World Report, College Express, Peterson's, you know, they're the ones that can promote getting that. And there's actually a group you can join for the common data set to help with those questions. So. Hmm. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, th this is the resources uh, page on our website, and this is where we have our three charts, the top one, early decision and regular decision acceptance rate. You can download it as a sheet, which I prefer because then you can sort. Uh, a lot of people prefer to download it as a PDF, which is better for printing. Uh, then both. below that, Or both. That's right. Um, it costs the same. Um which is zero. Um, another discussion, another private discussion Jenny and I had years ago and she won. Um, uh, domestic undergraduate need-based aid is here and then financial aid for international non-citizens. Uh, we, we changed the name on that. Um, that used to be- um, The common data set language was changed too. That's right, that's right, from-, from Aliens, it, call them aliens. Non-resident aliens. Non-resident yeah. aliens to international non-citizens. <clears throat> yeah, that stop. sounds way really better than being an I'll, alien. That's for sure. Yeah. So what about on the financial aid and the merit aid? Did you, have, did you notice an increase, especially on the international one? Is there more and more colleges offering merit aid or need-based aid for international students? So I think that one's tricky. In the ED chart, Cindy, um, every institution that offers ED is going to be listed in the chart because they all have plans. Whether we can get the data or not, there will just be blank lines. With the financial aid, um, it was a very subjective list that Jeff and I made kind of at the beginning of, you know, since international was the first one, what are international families looking for? We know that they look at U.S. news. So top 100 engineering, top 100 business, top 100 national universities, top 100 liberal arts colleges, colleges that change lives, you know, any type of little like consortium or whatever, like that we could come up with. Mm -hmm. um, they were included. And then along the way, literally any institution that asked to be included that sends us their common data set, 
we're happy to we're happy to include them. And, and tell them who tell people who we exclude. Yeah. So um, starting a couple of years ago, I was just fed up. Um, I um, manners matter a lot to me, and I was really tired of being ignored. So the institutions who consistently have not responded to the three annual emails that I send them asking for data over a period of three or more years are just taken off. Like they're just, we're not including them anymore. I'm sick of asking them for information. I think the ones who are bolder will just literally say, no, Jenny, we're not giving you the information. They know that I'm that we're going to put data requests denied because I think it's important to call them out a little bit. But, um, you know, then there's some other ones who are like, well, we're just going to ignore that email. Um, and so those are off. So it's not really a complete list in the in the first in the first place. And I think one of the things that's really jumped out at me is, you know, I and I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong domestically, but I also work with domestic students and I haven't seen it there either. Um, you know, cost of attendance continues to go up and I'm not seeing merit offers increase at the same rate, right? I'm, I think, you know, it's still like a $25,000 merit award is still large. Um, and, you know, that was large when tuition was 60,000 and it's large when tuition's 87. Um, one of the other things we saw were, were the cost of attendance. You know, there were these institutions that kind of hover, hover just below 80. And what we saw were institutions, some continued to hover below 80. Others, we were like, oh, they bit the bullet this year. And some of the ones that bit the bullet just like really bit the bullet, like went from, you know, 79 to 84 or something like, well, if we're going to be in the 80s, we're going to own it. Um, Jeff, Jenny, what jumped out at you? Is there um, a certain type of school that tends to not supply information that you notice or it's just it just depends? Sorry, could you repeat that? I was coughing. I'm so sorry. Anyways, is there a certain type of school that um, tends to not supply information or is it just case-by-case -case basis? Uh, two were mentioned in the chat. Uh, one type of school is called University of Chicago. Uh, <laughs> uh, they, I, they infuriated us. At, I think it was Salt Lake City NACAC, if I'm not mistaken, was, yeah. was that where that happened, Jenny? It might have been e Salt Lake. ED1, ED2. There was a session that three colleges, three four. or four, four colleges were up on the dais sharing their data on ED1 and ED2. And when it, and they were, the three of the four were completely transparent. One of the four who said, yeah, University of Chicago, who said yes to being on this panel discussion at NACAC, puts up their grid and it's empty. And basically they say, we don't feel like sharing that information. No, they said it's not ready yet. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. They said no. it's not ready yet. Yeah, it they hasn't been shared. ready, hasn't been ready for okay. six years. They shared data with us once. Accidentally, I believe. Boston <laughs> College shared data with us once, accidentally. I was like, oh, that intern's going to be fired. But Ron Lieber did just tell um, tell us that um, Boston College will begin publishing as well as some others. I think he had it in that article where, where we were mentioned. Oh, okay. uh, it, was, it was a call out, you know, it was a public shaming of uh, schools that are not sharing their common data set. Um, I haven't done a follow-up to see, I, I did right after the article came out and I saw, I couldn't get those kind of data sets. So we'll see if they actually follow up or not. Uh, I'm not um, going to hold my breath. So Susanna, you, you Rochester, I believe has started sharing data re recently. Yeah. I'll tell you who doesn't. And, and the they're team. in our, and they're in our chart because yeah. they, we did, we did get a hold of uh, Rochester. Um, the yeah. three B's and of the Boston Business Schools, Babson, Bryant, and Bentley never share data. I believe Babson was one of the other ones that Ron said might begin to share data. I can't remember. And it's really hit or miss. Here's the other thing, like Duke, 
I kept holding and holding. Like Jeff would be like, can we close the chart? Can we close the chart? And I'd be like, no, come on. Like Duke's got to pop up. Duke told me that they would have their data, I think in June, and they still didn't have it in, in August. And, you know, so some schools do publish, they just publish after our chart comes out, you know? And so some institutions will reach out to us, send us data. We'll do an update about a month later, but you know, we just can't track down everybody. Right. Well, and then that goes to the question of, well, why are certain colleges in the data and not? It has to do with whether they cooperate or not. Yeah. And, you know, I had an interesting conversation with um, a Catholic university the first year that I asked for for data and they didn't they didn't have any. And they said, you know, we'll have to get back to you. They said we were just afraid that people are going to come come away with the wrong idea about us as an institution. You know, some of it is just about them controlling the message. You know, they may be working really hard, um, you know, on improving something and they're afraid, well, our numbers still aren't fabulous, even though we've come so, so far. I know in the case of you, of you, Rochester, I had a late night exchange via like Facebook Messenger um, I didn't realize I was talking to the head of en enrollment or admissions at the time. I had no idea. And I was kind of saying, why, you know, why isn't um, our information in the chart? We do a great job with financial aid for international students. And I said, well, this man in your office told me to never contact you again, that you're not going to share your data. So, you know, again, it's just an institution. There's so many different offices, different policies, they don't all communicate amongst themselves either. So, no, they don't. <laughs> and you bring up another really good point: is if somebody comes or goes, then their approach and their philosophy can change depending on who's in charge of that aspect. As and well. that happened exactly. with Rochester. We had it, and then we didn't have it. Um, and I see Beth um, Beth's question about what we know about Tufts numbers. Um, I know zero, but I can tell you that I suspect they'd be in that top twenty-five for accepting more than 50% of the class in ED. So, so um, how do you use this with parents and students? What, what advice or what have you found that works well to be able to, to use this data and help communicate with parents, especially in terms of, okay, here's what you're looking for. We're looking for the right fit. Let's not fixate on you know prestige. How do you use it? Well, Jenny and I are big, and I know you are too, Cindy, we're, we're big believers in financial fit along with, uh, along with academic and social cultural fit. There, I mean, I, I feel, and many of you have heard me say this many, many times, I feel we're doing the family a disservice if we come up with a suggested list of colleges that in the end, they're not going to be able to afford. Um, and that means we've got a lot of hard work to do early in the process, figuring out what kinds of schools are appropriate for these families financially. It's hard. I, I know it's hard, but that's part of our job, in my opinion. That information is knowable without being too invasive. Um, so how, how do I use it with my families? From the initial consultation that I have with my families, we have a question on our, on our parent survey, is the net cost of college a factor in where your child will enroll? Totally non-invasive. If they answer no on that survey, which has smart logic, no other question comes up about finances. But if they answer yes, then there's a multiple choice. Is it one of many factors? Is it a significant factor? Is it an overriding factor? Um, and how the parent answers that question tells me a great deal about how much attention I need to pay to making sure that the first list of colleges I'm giving um, you know, a, 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 a junior, um, uh, how important financial fit is. So I wanna learn uh, as early as I possibly can, it, where this family is on the needs spectrum 
And my first great teacher in understanding this was someone by the name of Cindy McDonald, um, who, who Jack, has can had I this. Stop you right there. I'm so sorry. Can you repeat the second option again, and then go on to how Cindy's so amazing? Sorry. Um, <laughs> so if they say yes, the uh, net cost of college is a factor in where our child will enroll. The three choices that come up are. It's one of many factors. It's a significant factor. It's an overriding factor. Now, I'm not, I don't know if these questions are right for everybody, but they're right for me. And um, you, can, you can approach it however you want. But um, that's learning their subject, that tells me nothing about their income. I mean, this may be a family earning three quarters of a million dollars a year. And I had such a family who told me at the initial consultation, we're not spending more than 20,000 a year on college because we don't think it's worth it. So, you know, I'm not there to change their values. I'm there to understand what their ability to pay and their willingness to pay. Um, so um, now, Cindy, how Cindy is so great. She taught me, she was probably my first teacher in helping me understand the importance of knowing where a family falls on the needs spectrum. If a family has moderate to substantial need, demonstrated need, a student, then I'm going to want to provide schools that are meeting 90, 95, 100% of need. I'm not going to put NYU on that child's list because the gap is going to be tens of thousands of dollars. Um, on the other hand, if a family has little or no demonstrated need, but uh, tells me I can't afford eighty thousand, or I choose not to spend eighty thousand a year, then you know I, I'm going to let them know that the Ivies may be, you know, may belong, or some of them may belong on the students list, but they're not going to get a dime in merit aid. That's information they need to have right from the start. And I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but um, but that's that's where I that's how all of this comes into play with the families that I'm just beginning to work with. Makes sense. Well said. So what about from your perspective, Jenny? Well I only um, ask if college if the cost of college is going to be a significant factor because um, many of my families are international and I don't even know that they'd catch all the nuances <laughs> of the different <laughs> levels. I, I think it's just important to ask some sort of question because that's how you get the conversation started, right? It's, you know, if, if, if you're just ignoring it, then it's really hard. And I can say that this year, more than any other year, I have had families, I literally just got a message this morning from a mother saying, is there any possibility for financial aid? And this was a full pay family. I had another parent a couple of weeks ago who said, you know, the markets are bad. Um, I'm concerned. There's two younger sisters. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of anxiety around the cost of college right now with families. Obviously there's anxiety about the economy. Uh, I mean, everything, right? <laughs> we all know what we're living in. Um, so I, I just think it's important to have a way to, to broach it with, with families, because if not, there's no way that you can, you can build a list. You just can't. Cindy, can I say, I know we want to get into more Q and a, but, <clears throat> um, a couple of caveats about our, our data. Mm -hmm. Um, so Jenny may see from the international financial aid chart that a school is incredibly generous with need-based aid to international students. But that doesn't tell us that they're going that that school is going to be admitting every uh, every international student with substantial need. It just means that those that they choose to admit, they're going to be giving a lot of a lot of aid to. So, our brains can make assumptions that are not always accurate. Same is true with the EDRD chart. Um, we might see that a school gives applicants a three times advantage 
applying ED to RD. But what our data is not telling us is what percentage of, the, of that ED cohort are recruited athletes who are getting admitted at 85 or 90 or 95 percent uh, uh, acceptance rate because they've already been cleared by the admission office and the coach. Um, so if it's, if it's an athletic school and you're seeing a big advantage in the ED acceptance rates, don't think that that advantage applies to your non-athlete, non-legacy student, because it's not, it's gonna be a different, it's gonna be a much smaller advantage. So use this data smartly, don't make too many assumptions from it. I think that's well spoken, Jeff. And, and it points to the importance of understanding strategic enrollment management. And this is one of the things that Jeffrey Salingo has talked about too. He covers this in his book, Who Gets In and Why. And, and we also covered it in an interview that I did with him for UCLA. So if any of you haven't heard that, that's on my YouTube channel you'll, and we'll put links into it as well. But everything you said, you know, if it's, if it's, um, athletes or legacy, um, understanding, you know, I mean, colleges or businesses, they, they have to admit students in order to keep their doors open. Now, a highly selective or reductive, whatever term you want to use, you know, they're, they're in a different category, um, but they still, I mean, they're still coming from a business perspective, regardless. And it's not, we, often become disillusioned because we discover that this is not an altruistic thing where all students who are qualified to get in that school are not getting in and it can be such a disappointment. Well, when you've got 30,000, 40,000 students and you could admit those classes four times over, then it turns into other things, so. Yeah, and, the... I, and I can add to that. Um, you know, I see a real difference between um, an international student who is also a U.S. citizen, who's a, you know, a dual passport holder. Um, they, uh, they're going to have much greater chances because the colleges love to give away that federal money first, right? So it's very different if you have an international, truly international, not a, not a dual passport holder, um, with where one of the passports is the U.S. is the the students you can be the most incredible international student and not get in anywhere if you're high need, you know that that is just a reality and you know it's you can't even imagine the profiles of these kids that are not getting in. I mean they're exceptional, and um, but it, but you know if a student has a has a U.S. diploma they will definitely get options. Mm -hmm. That's that's interesting. That's good to know. So as we're closing up, um, Carmen, are there any questions or things that we haven't covered? Um, yes. So there is a more case specific. I have a student who's interested in Tufts. The question is ED1 versus ED2. Um, and she's also interested in another highly rejected school that offers ED. Uh, um, I'll take a crack at that. Um, I don't think we, I don't think we're, it's possible for us to know what a particular institution is going to do with ED1 and ED2. I look at the comparison between those two rounds as ED2 is a chance for them to pick up those specific students that they weren't able to find in ED1. We don't know. They don't know ahead of time. Um, how they're going to fare in ED1 in terms of getting the students that will help them meet their 40, 50, 60, 80 institutional um, um, uh, prerogatives, um, uh, priorities. So um, I, um, the way I approach it, and Jenny, you may feel differently, is if a student is not, if, if cost is not an important factor, then ED is something certainly to consider. And I would say that the student should apply to their first choice. If they have a school above all others that they really love, don't, don't play it strategically. If there's a school you love more than all the others, go for it in ED1. If you get denied or deferred, then, and there's another in your second choice as ED2, then, uh, then maybe that becomes your ED2 school. 
I don't think we can know more than that. Right. Yeah. I'm going to add to that just because um, in case anyone's working with international students, um, especially those who have need, it's a little bit different. I think with a domestic student who has need, um, a lot of times the advice is if you want to be able to compare financial aid packages, don't apply ED because, you know, you won't, you won't be able to do that. For an international student, it's actually quite important to use those ED rounds because if an institution is going to be investing that sort of money in a student, they want to know that they're going to yield, right? So um, what I what I recommend is e ED1, and then for ED2, if they do not get into that ED school, you should definitely take advantage of ED2, but it should be a different tier. You know, you want to drop down a tier or two because it's just that hard. Yeah, yeah that's... I think that's good advice. Very good advice. Um, and we, don't, we can't we can't read their minds. And all you can do is use the data to to help give you some kind of a a guide and just um, a tool. It's nice to have it as well because it gives you something that's objective. You know, so I'm not just the counselor saying this. It's here's the data that shows, and here's why I'm recommending that you do X, Y, Z, and cover everything. So. Go ahead, Carmen. Is there any thoughts on how much a college will stick with ED being binding? Uh, yeah, they really stick to it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, you, I, not. I mean, go ahead, Jeff. You, you could a, a family can get out of an ED contract for financial reasons, but you don't want to put yourself in that situation because <laughs> imagine walking away in December, in, in December fifteenth from an offer of acceptance, because the financial aid offer wasn't good enough. You're walking away from that, not knowing where you're gonna get into the other schools you're applying to and what those financial uh, aid offers are gonna be. Uh, the, that parent is putting their child in a terrible, excuse me, terrible situation. Yeah. And Kathy has a question um, about, about um, SAT and ACT in the common data set. So she says, I'm finishing up a blog post about the number and percentage of enrolled students submitting test scores using common data set. Other than acknowledging possibility of a single student submitting both the SAT and ACT, do you have any other advice or interpretations from, from that kind of data? Hold on, I have to, I have to process this for a second. Number. It's in the chat. Yeah, I guess I don't understand the question. Kathy, you'll have to write the article and let us know. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> Kathy. I, it, it may be my COVID fog today. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been great. Um, I would also say, you know, another person, since we're touching on the topic of ED, Another really good person to listen to and who has a very good handle on this and, and has a perspective on this is Peter Van Buskirk. And so I'll bring, I've had Peter on my show before, I'll bring him back and we'll talk about AD1, AD2 and that perspective. So um, Jenny, thank you so much. Jeff, thank you very much. And I know people love using your data and, and it has become something that many, many people around the world depend on. So thanks for sharing today and for being here. And, um, and you can see we've had over a hundred people and yeah. on your, on the call today. So, well, thanks for having us. I Thank feel you so, so honored. Much. <laughs> it's, um, it's been such a pleasure to do these. So next week, we're going to welcome Dan Bicek. And he's going to talk about the FAFSA and the profile. So this fits in with our topic from today. If they're going to apply for this financial aid, a lot of times they're going to do the FAFSA and the profile. And there's huge differences. A lot of changes coming up on that. We don't really have definitive answers on that yet. But Dan's going to talk about that. And then and so that's October 7th and then October 21st. Um, I posted a little video of um, Provost and Executive Vice President Pardis Mahdavi 
And um, she is just so inspirational. Her story as an Iranian American and what her and her families have gone through and what she went through when she was jailed in Iran um, and how that's going to impact higher education and just kind of um, disrupting, blazing a new trail, you know, being a disruptor in higher ed. So please join us for that. And you guys, everybody have a great weekend. Please take care of yourself, no matter where you are and stay safe and stay dry, hopefully. And I'll see you back here in a week. Thank you.